Good morning. Uh, today I'll uh, talk for about half an hour on design challenges for advanced nuclear reactors, beginning from uh, the pressurized water reactor PWR uh, all the way up to Gen 4 futuristic designs. Uh, this is part one of, uh, of a two-part uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this uh, consists of uh, about 20 slides and I hope to finish it in about 20 minutes. Uh, I'm Professor Dr. Zafrullah Qureshi, uh, Professor at Air University, Islamabad, Pakistan. And in the part two, the simulations will be shown by engineer Umair Aziz, lecturer at Air University and PhD candidate um, uh, working on Gen 4 reactor design. So, in this part of the presentation, I'll begin with uh, section 1.1. Introducing nuclear reactors, uh, coming on to the pressurized water reactor because uh, PWRs are about 70% of the total uh, nuclear power reactors in the world. And uh, in 1.3, plant parameters, design parameters, and some process variables. Process means uh, temperature, pressure, flow rates, uh, as uh, typically used in industry, the term process variables. Then 1.4, methods for the design of nuclear reactors, 1.5, Gen 4 reactors, and 1.6, small and modular reactors, and finally 1.7, I'll uh, talk a little bit about how we define a severe accident in nuclear power plants. Okay, so... Uh, nuclear reactors. Now, nuclear reactors are uh, classified by energy in uh, two uh, uh, broad groups, thermal and fast. Uh, th the, the word thermal refers to the thermal spectrum of the neutron flux. Uh, thermal neutrons uh, have speeds of 2200 meters per second, uh, corresponds to 0 0.025 electron volts, as is uh, the uh, thermal equilibrium at room temperature and fast reactors have a, a higher energy spectrum typically uh, of the order of kilo electron volts uh, in the upper range of the keV and they have no moderation there's no slowing down of neutrons so let's look at the first category of thermal neutrons uh, we've got light water reactors heavy water reactors and graphite reactors in this group uh, the, the two main light water reactors are the PWR, the pressurized water reactor, and the boiling water reactor. Uh, both of these have uranium dioxide, 2 to 4 percent typically enriched fuel, and are moderated and cooled by <coughs> light water. <coughs> the term pressurized in PWR stands for high pressure, 2250 psi, as we'll see. At uh, this pressure, we can use water at a higher temperature than otherwise, and typically up to 285 Celsius, so that boiling does not occur and we have a good thermal efficiency. Uh, boiling water reactors allow water to boil, and so you can operate them at lower pressure than PWRs. Now, heavy water reactors started from Canada, the Canadian deuterium uranium reactor, which was a natural uranium-based design, but used D2O, heavy water, as moderator and coolant. <clears throat> the graphite reactors, historically the first graphite reactors were in the United Kingdom, the GCRs, the Magnox reactors, with graphite and carbon dioxide as the coolant. A moderation by graphite and heat removal by carbon dioxide gas. They used uh, natural uranium and uh, then moved on to the advanced gas cool reactor design in which the uranium dioxide fuel is 2.5 to about 3.5% enriched. <coughs> now, uh, another design of the graphite reactor is the RBMK, the Russian design, uh, which uses uranium dioxide slightly enriched as graphite for a moderator, but water as a coolant. Uh, the other category, the fast reactors, began historically again with the uh, experimental breeder reactor in the United States. Uh, the LMFBR, the Liquid Metal Fast Breeder Reactor. Now, the idea here was to use, instead of water, 
uh, a liquid metal such as sodium. Liquid sodium is a coolant. Uh, mixed oxide fuel, which mixed stands for uranium and plutonium. So we could achieve higher burn-ups and breed its own fuel and uh, a higher uh, enrichment of fuel to begin with. Now, if you see the World Nuclear Association numbers of 2021, then PWR is 302 out of 436 at that time, so it comes to about 70%. Okay, so just to give you some idea, what are the electricity requirements for a city of 1 million? Now, it depends which country in the world you're living in. In the United States, the figures were for household consumption of 2023 of 4,500 units per year, a unit being a kilowatt hour. The world average is about 700, while Pakistan is below world average 400 kilowatt hours per year household. So in one year, you can calculate the number of hours. And from that, we get a nuclear power plant of one megawatt. If it's operating at 100% capacity for so many hours, then you produce 8,760 megawatt hours. <coughs> now, in the United States, if you use this number, then 1,000 megawatt would be good for about 2 million people, uh, household. And uh, uh, But for a country like Pakistan, which has a much lower uh, uh, energy consumption household, it could be good for as many as 20 million people. Okay, so it all begins with the nuclear fission reaction. Uh, as you know that there are uh, two nuclear uh, reactions which produce energy. One is nuclear fission, the other is nuclear fusion. So fission means breaking uh, heavier nuclides, fissile nuclides such as U-235, uranium and plutonium-239 bombarding them uh, by a neutron and uh, the uh, nuclide breaks into uh, two other uh, nuclides, gives out neutrons and energy. Now, per fission, we get about 200 MeV of energy, thermal energy. So if you were to burn or utilize one gram of uranium, uh, to utilize each uh, <coughs> nucleide of uranium uh, and consider that uh, a gram atom has Avogadro's number, then if you do that calculation, you <coughs> find that the fissioning of one gram of uranium gives you an energy of one megawatt day. So that's the number we got to remember when we talk of uh, burn up of fuel utilization in uh, nuclear power plants. The higher the burn up, the better the fuel utilization, the more it's out. Okay, so nuclear power plants, I'm talking of nuclear power plants. There are, of course, uh, research reactors, there are submarine propulsion plants, there are production reactors. But if you take a look at nuclear power plants, NPPs, then we would say that a large power plant would have in excess of 1,000 megawatt electric capacity, which would be typically be used for base load power. Uh, medium NPP, 700 to 1,000 megawatt, <coughs> again, for base load power. Small, small modular, 100 to 700 uh, megawatt power for flexible grid power and for modular construction. Below that, you've got very small modular reactors, uh, micronuclear reactors, uh, specialized locations, uh, specialized applications, for example, remote locations, or even smaller micronuclear for propulsion, space propulsion, nuclear batteries for very specialized uh, small applications. <clears throat> Now, this map over here, the world map shows in red the uh, distribution of nuclear power plants in the United States. You see there on the east side, Europe, mostly red here. China, again on the east side. India, seven in Pakistan and Africa, uh, yet to come. <coughs> this figure shows you <coughs> the uh, countries with, uh, uh, with the most nuclear reactors. The United States historically started with the nuclear energy uh, of, and the United Kingdom with Magnox reactors, but uh, America has the most nuclear power plants in excess of 90, and uh, uh, and now the activity, the greatest activity is in Asia, China with the largest number of constructions, and so Asia uh, with Middle East, China leading uh, in nuclear power plants. 
Now, in this, you can see that Africa is moving nuclear also. The blue indicates countries which uh, are in the process or have signed agreements with Russia, while red are with China. Okay, so here's a, uh, when you, uh, a little freehand drawing of a pressurized water reactor. There's a big dome. There's a cooling tower. Now, this dome, a huge containment uh, building houses the core at the center and we've got the uranium fuel rods so the core is also fairly big and this is a very high structure this is the containment building which uh, in case of an accident then it should contain the uh, <coughs> the fission products from uh, going out into the environment and causing damage so in the core you've got hot fuel rods and water being circulated there, water being converted into steam, uh, going to the turbine, generator, transformer, producing electricity, going through the pylons into our grid. Now, the, the water coming out from the turbine gets condensed and recycled through a pump into the core, and some of it goes back into the huge cooling tower where it cools and comes back, recycles into the uh, reactor. Now here's a, a better engineering layout of a pressurized water reactor. So here you can see the reactor, the two steam generators, the pressurizer which keeps the system at high pressure so the water doesn't boil. And so the cold leg takes the, uh, the cold water into the um, uh, core, the hot leg takes the hot water into the steam generators and uh, uh, where from the secondary side you've got water coming in converting into steam and going into these high pressure and low pressure turbines and getting condensed and uh, through feed pumps going back into the reactor. Now the word cold and hot doesn't necessarily mean very cold because as I said that the high pressure enables the inlet flow conditions to be fairly hot water, as I'll show you in the next slides. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, the fuel, the nuclear fuel. So there's a person six feet tall standing next to a fuel rod, which is about 12 feet, and it has uh, pellets of uranium dioxide, fabricated pellets. And so here's a fuel rod going into a fuel assembly, and a lot of assemblies going into the a core and the core going into a pressure vessel and the pressure vessel going into that containment building I just spoke of. So uh, typically uh, 1000 megawatt electric uh, react nuclear reactor would have 41,448 of these rods <clears throat> in 17 by 70, 17 by 17 uh, arrangement placed in a fuel assembly. Now WNA World Nuclear Association gives the fuel cost for beginning from uranium material to conversion to enrichment, for example. Uh, so you've got to convert U U3O8 into, U into UF4, UF6 gas, and put the UF6 gas through, for example, a enrichment plant, and which also gives you UF6, and then you have to solidify and fabricate the fuel. So if you look at the costs, so the uranium material takes about 51% of the cost at $90 roughly per kg. Uh, conversion cost, enrichment cost. Uh, now this is for uh, up to 4 to 5% enriched fuel. The enrichment cost depends on the separated work units, which you can get from a calculator on Urenco, for example. Then there's the fabrication cost of about 18%. So the total per kilogram cost would be about 1663 US dollars per kg. So one ton would come to about $1.7 million. And in a pressurized water reactor, 1,000 megawatt electric, we would have about $170 million um, dollars worth of fuel. So on the previous slide, uh, the capital cost was shown. So it's about 2,500 to about 6,900 per kilowatt hour. So that would be roughly three to $4 billion on the lower side capital costs and $170 million for the fuel cost. So this gives you some uh, idea of the, of the um, finances involved. Then, of course, there are other finances also. 
the operation and management expenses, the labor costs, and so on, which all add up to the final uh, pricing for a nuclear power plant. Okay, so now we come to the engineering design parameters and the process variables. Design tells you how big or small the size of the reactor. So if you look at a small reactor, 300 megawatt electric uh, PWR, this went up to a 600, which was the generation three, which I'll talk about. And that got improved into the AP1000, uh, Advanced Passive uh, Westinghouse Design 1, 1000 megawatt electric. Now, the bigger the reactor, the more is the burn up. So you can see 30,000 megawatt days per ton in the small reactor, 60,000 megawatt days per ton. So better fuel utilization. The maximum temperatures, you can see about 1200 Celsius central line temperature. You can go up because the melting is 2865 C, which of course depends on the composition and the burn up. And the maximum clad temperature. Now, remember clad, we've got zirconium alloy, zirc alloy, so we would not like it to uh, to come into contact with the fuel, but if it, if it doesn't, then you can operate at a higher temperature. But when there's expansion, as we'll see in, the, in part two in the structural side, so as the temperature gets hot, there are thermal stresses, so then you have to be careful about what temperatures you operate on. The coolant is light water and Process variables, about 14,300 kilograms per second. So it's a very high flow rate over here. You can compare this with a 300 megawatt electric reactor. Now the cold deck, as I said last time, the coolant inlet is, is 279.4 Celsius in this case, coming out at 324.7. Now you might wonder this is greater than 100 Celsius and it's not boiling. Well, it's not boiling because of the high pressure, 2250 PSI. Uh, so here's the pressure, and the geometry of the fuel assembly was 17 by 17. So these are the inlet and outlet temperatures of the 300 megawatt electric, and these are the inlet and outlet. So the delta T is not very big, but the flow rate is big, and that's what takes out the 3200 megawatt thermal out of a 1000 megawatt electric uh, nuclear power plant, because the thermodyna thermodynamic efficiency is just slightly over uh, 32, 34, 35%. Uh, so it's it's not it's not like 45% or 50%. So these are these give you some idea of the flow param of the uh, uh, flow conditions in a thousand megawatt electric PWR. Okay, so now let's continue to see how big the reactor is. So the active height of an AP1000, and that's 300, is 4.267 meters. It's about 14 feet. The equivalent die is about three meters. Uh, three kinds of fuel enrichments, uh, because we've got uh, more burn up at the center. So uh, you can put lower enriched fuel at the, the center of the core and higher enriched. And gradually, as the burn up increases here, you can shuffle this, bring it here. So the fuel cycle arrangement has typically three kinds of enriched fuel. Now the fuel inventory, as I said, for in a 1000 megawatt would be about 100 tons, 96 tons in this case, and 35 tons for a 300 megawatt reactor. Number of fuel assemblies, 157 over here with 264 rods per assembly. And if you multiply these two numbers, you'd get about 41,000. 448 fuel rods. Now each rod has uh, uh, outer diameter given here and uh, about 8.1915 millimeters <coughs> and the pellet height of one pellet is about uh, 9.8 millimeters. So uh, the clad thickness is about 0.5715 millimeters Clad material is zerlo, which is zirconium alloy, uh, and uh, moderator is light water, the coolant is light water. The number of primary pumps would depend on the flow rate of the coolant, and that would, of course, be determined by the high, by the mm, thermal energy that you would be removing from a bigger plant compared to a lower plant. 
Now, on this side, I put the melting point of uh, UO2, typically 2865 Celsius, depends on the composition and the burn up. It goes down to about 58 Fahrenheit for every 10,000 megawatt days per ton. Uh, you can see the cladding temperature, and this is taken from the PNNL report 31158, the material libraries uh, that you can get the properties from. Okay, now. Uh, an overview on what kind of analysis is used for the design of nuclear reactors. The first thing is criticality. And for criticality, how much uranium do you need? How much plutonium do you need? Or what is, should be the shape, sphere, cylinder, uh, box, or some other configuration? Because remember, we would like the chain reaction to be self-sustaining. So the K, which is the effective multiplication, is a measure of the uh, of the uh, chain reaction. If K is 1, that means for every one fission neutron going in, you um, one survives, the others get leaked uh, from the system or captured. And so when you have a good self-sustaining chain reaction, you can produce electricity in a nice, peaceful, continuous manner. But if you have uh, a growth of K going greater than 1, then you've got supercriticality and there will be too much thermal energy and it would uh, melt down, it would explode. So that would be supercritical. Subcritical would be where uh, one neutron eventually uh, dies out and that could be an experiment, a subcritical experiment which you're performing in some laboratory. So in a nuclear power plant, the first thing you've got to do, and I'll talk more in part two of it, is to estimate the criticality. And for that, the uh, Traditional methods have been deterministic based on the diffusion equation, the neutron diffusion equation, which comes out of a simplification of the neutron transport equation, which comes out of Boltzmann's uh, transport equation, which he wrote for the kinetic theory of gases, and uh, also used in fluid mechanics, the Navier-Stokes equation, for example. So the moments of Boltzmann's transport equation are basically the conservation equations, and we use them in nuclear engineering too. So that's one side of the deterministic nuclear methods, which use traditional ma mathematical methods like finite difference, finite element methods, discrete ordinates, SN methods, and spherical harmonics, PN methods. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other way of looking at things is the probabilistic stochastic Monte Carlo method, which you could understand to be based on the integral form of Boltzmann's equation. And uh, Neumann formulated a, a series approach to that, and we use it a lot in Monte Carlo simulation uh, to uh, handle bigger, complex systems more efficiently. So once you've determined criticality, then we come to thermal hydraulics. Thermal meaning heat, hydraulics meaning the uh, flow of fluid and uh, typical heat and fluid flow equations. Again, you could start from deterministic methods, finite difference, finite element methods of standard heat conduction, convection, uh, empirical formulas, Nusselt number, Reynolds, Prandtl number. And for hydraulics, the conservation of matter, momentum, and energy uh, with, the, uh, with the constitutive equation closing the system and solving them by traditional deterministic methods. <clears throat> so criticality and thermal hydraulics, then we move on to structural analysis, where you know the familiar stress-strain relationships, the generalized Hooke's law, again used by finite difference, finite element methods. Uh, all these three done, you come to radiation, because you've got nuclear radiation. Now remember, nuclear radiation is different from what we call atomic radiation. So alpha, beta, neutron and gamma. These typical uh, nuclear radiations uh, have high energies and play a very important role in nuclear reactors. So these are estimated by the radiation transport equation, which is again based on the uh, neutron and photon and uh, charged particle transport equations. So having done the criticality, thermal hydraulic structural radiation transport, then the depletion analysis because nucleides are dis destroyed and created uh, in the process. So uranium and plutonium, the fissile nucleides, would be consumed, while the transuranics and the actinides would be produced, some of them being plutonium 
239 from U238, 240, 241, and of course in water systems, thermal systems, xenon and samarium, which have high absorption cross sections and act as poisons. So to do that, we have coupled ODEs, which are uh, the traditional Bateman equations and uh, their standard methods of how to handle differential coupled order differential equations. So having done all that, you need to have got some control analysis of proportional integral derivative systems or couple systems. And uh, because you would not like the transients to grow beyond control. So, and these days you've got uh, uh, AI methods, uh, adaptive methods, and there's a lot of development going on over here. Finally, the accident analysis. So if your systems fail, if you cannot remove heat, uh, if, for example, you have a pump failure, the coolant stops, <coughs> then uh, heat is being continuously produced and you can have a large excursion, which means the core can melt down. And uh, we've had a number of accidents, just few, wind scale, TMI, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Uh, Chernobyl, the uh, containment flew up uh, many, many meters into the sky and uh, radiation was released in the environment. So these are the typical and all coupled analysis that go into the design of nuclear reactors. If you look at just like human beings, we've got generations of nuclear uh, power plants. The first generation began in the 50s, second generation, third generation in the 80s, 90s, and I was talking of AP1000, which is a generation three plus. So it had several improvements upon generation three. Futuristic reactors coming uh, five to 10 years from now are the Gen 4 reactors, which I'll be going through briefly in the next few slides. So Gen 4, you can see that there's a Gen 4 International Forum set up in 2000 to study potential systems with it's an international undertaking by about 14 partners it started with. So the objective is to come up with compact, reliable, flexible, and safe systems to address public concerns on long-term nuclear waste disposal and proliferation. And uh, we'll have a nuclear renaissance. And the success of that would depend on how uh, it would compete with uh, in, the, in the free markets, compete with renewables and fossil because nuclear has many, many advantages. Um, so the Gen 4 undertaking uh, shortlisted six reactor technologies, the gas cool fast reactor, lead cool fast reactor, molten salt reactor, supercritical water cool reactor. Now, this doesn't mean neutronic supercriticality. It means working above the uh, critical point of water where you could have uh, water behaving sometimes as a vapor, sometimes as a liquid, so you can uh, use to your advantage. You can twitch the process parameters and uh, improve uh, heat removal. So and you could have, uh, then there's a sodium cool fast reactor and a very high temperature reactor. So these are the six designs, the six candidates uh, systems for uh, futuristic Gen 4 systems. Now, this slide shows you some of the, uh, summarizes some of the features and challenges. Now, as you can see that some are far spectrum and few of them are thermal spectrum. They're all moved towards relatively higher enrichment, high burn up, higher temperatures and the use of liquid metals rather than water. But uh, these uh, bring in challenges, although there's a lot of historical database because a lot of these technologies were worked on in the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s. So there's a lot of uh, experience, a uh, lot of collection of knowledge that these are working on. But the challenges are that when you look at high temperature systems, there's special materials issues, there's corrosion, there's thermal hydraulics, and the handling of liquid metals. So these are the challenges that designers and uh, even exper experimentalists are uh, trying to get a better understanding of it. Uh, this slide shows you some of the highlights I've taken from the technology roadmap 
uh, of the nuclear energy agency, you can see that they give importance to fast reactors, mainly due to their breathing capability and uh, advanced separation technologies, material testing, and improved safety. Uh, this slide summarizes uh, some more points which you could look at uh, for the six candidates and compares the small modular reactors with Gen 4 reactors. So you can see that, again, moving to higher uh, temperatures. So SMRs, SMRs are modular construction in a factory. So you can either add to an existing base load or you could uh, you could gradually build the capacity of a nuclear power plant. But they all move from uh, to into higher temperatures, as you can see. And that's based on the use of liquid metals. Now, small modular reactors. There's a new development coming up, and uh, it's being led by a number of companies. So small modular reactor, by definition, uh, of the International Atomic Energy Agency is a nuclear power plant uh, with a capacity 100 to 700 megawatt electric. So you can see there's a large number of designs which are actively being worked on. And uh, you could go to websites of New Scale, Westinghouse, and then there's the Chinese uh, uh, HTGR. So you could look at uh, the database over here, and there's some, uh, some development, especially on new scale, uh, where deployment would, uh, could be realized in the next few years. So this has been a brief overview, and I want to close this with uh, the most important thing in engineering, which is safety. Uh, safety means that whenever you work uh, on any engineering system, then you, uh, the most important thing is always safety. What can go wrong? What accident can take place? Because there's a human life which needs to be protected. There's the environment and the general public which needs to be protected. So for a nuclear reactor, because we are working with nuclear fuel, uh, radiation, so uh, you need to very carefully define what accident can take place. So a severe accident is defined as melting of the reactor core with fission product release causing harm to the workers and the, to the general population and to the environment. So there can be a release of radiation. That's why you saw that huge containment building, which I showed you on the second slide. And we've had accidents, for example, wind scale, uh, Three Mile Island, 1979, Chernobyl, 1986, and Fukushima about 10, 12 years back in Japan with boiling water reactors due to the tsunami. So nuclear has a little, uh, we've gone through three bad accidents and wind scale much before that. So, uh, so that's why uh, these concer uh, concerns have to be addressed. And to understand severe accidents, uh, many, many experiments and safety studies and simulations are routinely carried out. And when all these things have been sorted out, then we'll come to those Gen 4 reactors. So in part two of this uh, presentation, I'll go into the science and engineering, the mathematical modeling. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, this was just uh, an overview, and I tried to finish it in uh, 33 minutes. Uh, of course, these days, there's a chat, chat GPT, and uh, maybe you can get uh, quick uh, information by going on the open AI tools. But still, I would say there's no substitute for uh, learning from uh, senior people, especially professors and professionals in the field. So I think that these uh, about 20 slides have given you a fairly good introduction to nuclear reactors, uh, specifically to PWRs, which are about 70% uh, of the total nuclear power plants in the world. Thank you so much.